Now that we have all of our modeling sheets set up, we've configured our workspace and we're familiar with the other tools such as the JTools add-on that we're going to be using throughout this project, we're going to jump right into the modeling. So when we're doing hard surface modeling, one of the things that we need to be aware of is the overall scope of our project, but more importantly, how to not let that scope overwhelm you. So with hard surface modeling, not as much with this specific project, but when you start doing lots of like highly detailed vehicles or locomotives or any other kind of very detailed hard surface object, one of the things that you wanna be very careful of is to not get ahead of yourself. So since we have a lot of you know hard surface being defined by basically a object that is not malleable, so things like metal or you know polished wood or you know anything like that hard plastic, anything that is rigid, such as our little airplane here, oftentimes these are going to have a lot of details, but they're also very smooth generally. So like we've got you know the on our plane here the overall body of the plane is really smooth. The nose cone is smooth. But then we have things like the holes in the nose cone that are, have sharp edges, but they're circular holes. And so when we start creating all of these objects and all the details, we need to be careful not to get ahead of ourselves in the mesh because the, the more complex we make the mesh, the harder it is to modify it as we go. So basically, a good general rule of thumb when you're doing hard surface modeling, regardless of the complexity of your object, is to keep it simple first and then as you start going along gradually get more and more and more complex by starting simple and doing what's called blocking this is generally the first phase of the process by blocking things out you can go in and create the overall forms of your subject matter in a very simple representation and then begin adding more and more detail so in this case what we're going to be doing is basically we're going to be doing two things first we're going to block in the shape and then we're going to detail the shape. And in this case, we're going to start by blocking in the body. So when I say body, basically I refer to everything from the nose cone to the tail, excluding the propeller blades, the wheels, the wings, the tail fins, and the cockpit. So basically we're just gonna be creating this kind of elongated football shape of sorts. So that's gonna be the first step. So to do this, we don't need our default cube. So let's just hit X and delete. What I want to do is I want to create this basic shape. Now we don't need this view right now, so I'm just going to maximize this view. You can maximize any region within Blender, whether that's the UV image editor, the 3D view, the outliner, etc., by simply hovering over the view and hitting shift space. So that will temporarily maximize my view. You notice we have a button up here called back to previous, or we can simply hit shift space again to go back. So hitting shift space, let's now hit three to go to side view and we can see our overall view. So I'm going to hit shift A and I wanna basically just, I just wanna add in a cylinder to then start representing this form. And the way that this is going to work, just to give you a little bit of a heads up, is basically we're gonna create the basic form of this, this model. And then we're going to go in and we're going to create a second form over that using a shrink wrap modifier, which we'll get into later, that then allows us to go in and create these nice detailed sections like the insets and such for the cockpits. But the one thing that we need to think about when we're doing this is what are the requirements of the mesh? So for example, in the nose cone, we can see that we have these insets inside the mesh. Well, if we simply just added in a cylinder used a you know a random vertex count on that cylinder and then just started modeling we would probably find out later down the road that we couldn't use it you know whether it was because the vertex count didn't uh, wasn't sufficient enough for these insets or maybe it didn't support enough for the wings you know regardless we just didn't have enough geometry for one reason or the other so we want to try and think about things like this before we get started so in this case what i'm going to take into account are the nose cones now just from experience, I can tell you that for most of these, we're going to need um, one edge loop for each point of this. So we're going to need one edge loop here. We're going to need another edge loop here. We're going to need one going right through the center. And then ideally, we would have at least one between these, something like this. So this would basically represent one quarter of our entire piece. So if we assume that this is one quarter then, then we need one, two, three, four, five edge loops times four. So we're, we're going to need 20 edge loops in order to create this cylinder effectively. Now, 
if that suddenly seems overwhelming or whatnot, that's okay. Because a lot of these decisions that we make initially, we can always change down the road. It's just that if we can go ahead and make them accurately now, it's just going to save us a bit of hassle down the road. All right, so I'm going to hit Shift A. I'm going to add in a mesh and a cylinder. In the cylinder, let's then hit F6, which will bring up our operator panel, which, which you can also find from the toolbar down here. So you can see the operator panel here. In this case, I prefer just to use the F6. So we'll just hit F6, and we're going to change the vertex count from 32 to 20. That should then give us enough to work with. And if we look at this, you can see it's not too dense, but it gives us a reasonable number that then should allow us to extrude in all of these little insets, which, of course, I'm going to be showing you that entire process as we go. The next thing that I want to do is right now you can obviously see that this cylinder is facing the wrong direction. So we need to just rotate it 90 degrees. What we don't want to do when we're working on this is unless we have a good reason, we shouldn't be rotating objects in object mode. The reason being is that this dis or changes the local orientation. Whereas if we look at this object, if we bring up our properties panel, we scroll up to the transform section. Right now you can see that the rotation is 0, 0, 0. So this means as far as Blender is concerned, this object is just sitting there. It hasn't been rotated. The orientation has not been changed. If I rotate this 90 degrees, the rotation has now been set to X 90. So it's negative 90 degrees. Well, that's all fine and dandy for the time being, but there are certain modifiers that we're going to be using throughout this project that if this rotation is applied, so as if we used an array modifier, that would then distort the array modifier in each additional section, particularly if we're, say, arraying around an object, which if that's confusing you, just ignore it. It's all right. But if we were doing specific things, then it would basically take this rotation into account and do it for every single step. And so this is very, very common that uh, people will run into problems with modifiers because they've done one of two things. They've either rotated the object in object mode such that this rotation is not 0, 0, 0, or they've adjusted the scale in object mode, and the scale here is not 1 to 1 to 1. Unless you have a good reason, it's a good general rule of thumb to do all of your direct or basically your main rotation, such as like rotating this 90 degrees in edit mode. Because when you rotate this in edit mode, let me just set this back. If you rotate this in edit mode, it changes the mesh orientation, but not the object. And so now you can see that my mesh has been rotated, but the object has not. And the reason this is important is because if we look at the orientation modes, if we go to global and local, global refers to the overall world axis of Y, X, and Z. Whereas local, if we switch this on, and let me just enable the manipulators here, local refers to those X, Y, and Z orientations based on the object. So for example, if I just hit RR to go into trackball rotation for this object, and let's just skew it like this, you can see my rotation over here is mimicked, or it's showing the rotation. And now if I just left click, you can see that the orientation of the object has changed. And this is really, really valuable because this, what this means is now I can go in here and I can just move this object directly along the local coordinates any way that I choose. And this is also particularly valuable in edit mode because also in edit mode, I can follow those same local coordinates. Uh, so you just want to be aware of those as you go along. Now, if that didn't make much sense, don't worry about it. We're going to be going back to this later down the road uh, to talk about local and global orientations, particularly when doing things like the propeller blades. But for the time being, I just want to ensure that the rotation is zero. My scale is one to one to one. So if you ever need to remove these, basically you can hit control A to go in and apply the rotation or the scale or the location. And that will basically just reset these to default. So applying the location will zero out the rotations, applying the scale will return all the scales to one without actually modifying the object itself. All right, so that was a little bit long-winded, but it's a topic that gets a lot of people into trouble as you're getting started, so I just want to be sure to cover it. So we have our, our cylinder. Let's hit tab to go into edit mode, and now I just want to hit S, and we're going to scale this up to the approximate size of the body, something like that. All right, now let's go in here. Let's just hit A to deselect everything, and then I'm going to go into wireframe mode, so that, such that I can select everything behind it. And holding down control, I can just left click and drag and drag across here. And then let's just pull these out along the Y axis like this, right up to the nose cone. And then I'm gonna do the same thing on this side, pull this out right here until basically I reach each edge and have basically hit the size of this cylinder. 
Now, through the series, by the way, I am going to be using a lot of hotkeys, so you just pay attention to my, my hotkey box down here. Um, I actually prefer to not work with the manipulators. I find them a bit distracting. I'm going to leave them on for the first bit here just to help any of you guys that are getting on, on your feet. Just be aware that I won't be using them a whole lot, but I will make an effort to always call out my hotkeys. So the next thing that I want to do is with this piece still selected, I want to extrude it. So I just hit E to bring up my extrude tool, which you can also find the extrude tool from the toolbar here. And that is right here, extrude region. So if I click extrude region, I can just pull this out. I'm going to take it right out to the base of the tail fin right about there. And then I'll left click. I can now hit S to scale it down and scale it down to about the size of the cone. And then I'm going to repeat that process. So I'll hit E to extrude, take it out, scale it down. Now I'm not going to um, fill in this area yet. I'm just going to leave it with the single end gone that you see right here, the single surface. Uh, and we're going to clean that up later down the road. For now, let's just move this up along the Z axis from, since I'm in the side view, if I just hit G, it'll only move along the Z and the Y. So I can just move it up until it's roughly about like that. All right. Next, I want to go in, I want to add two more edge loops right down here. So using the grease pencil tool, which I'm just holding down control and D to allow me to drag this over. Um, I want to just add in what are called loop cuts or basically an edge loop or a set of edges right in here. So I'm going to hit control R, which brings up my loop cut tool. And now I can just using my purple indicator, I can hover over the edges that I want to cut and I can just left click and then I can slide my new cut to where I want it. So in this case, I'm going to place it approximately in the center, say something like that. And then I'm going to hit S and scale it up until it's about the size. And I'm going along the bottom line right here. I'm completely ignoring the cockpit. Right now, I just want to create this overall shell. And then I'm going to repeat that process. So I hit A to deselect everything. And I'm going to hit Control R, left click, and then uh, left click again to position the cut. And then I'll hit S to scale it about like that. So this is giving me my rough shape. I'm going to just hold down D and right click and drag just to delete those edges or those uh, grease pencil lines that I'd drawn in. And now I want to select this side. By the way, some of you may notice this is a little bit different, but I do not work with this button off. I always work with this on. So the limit selection of visible, if you turn this off, which by the way, the default state is off, you can see the background vertices. And this allows you to select all of those background vertices. But personally, I don't like this option because then it just makes the view a little messy. So I tend to turn this on, which just means that if I want to select some of those background vertices, I just need to go into wireframe mode first with Z, and then I can go in and select them. But another thing I can do is I can use my loop selection tool. So you can select a continuous set of edges, such as this one here, by holding down your Alt key and right clicking. And that will then select an edge loop. If you want to add to your selection, so if you want to select multiples, simply hold down Alt and Shift, and then you can select multiples. So in this case, if I just Alt right click on this, it'll select the entire end cap. And now I can just extrude it out like that. Left click, scale down. And you will notice that the shape is a little bit off, but that's okay. And then I'm just going to extrude it again and scale down. You'll notice the, the shape is off, but it's not dramatically off. And so we're just going to ignore it. This is just a fact of life in modeling when you're working from modeling sheets like this, is that sometimes you do have to compensate the design a little bit to deal with discrepancies. Next thing I want to do, so now I have basically my shell. And what I'm going to do now is I want to do two things. First, I want to add in a subdivision surface modifier, and I want to set my shading to smooth. First of all, we can add in a subdivision surface from our modifiers panel here by just hitting the modifiers, click add modifier, and choose subdivision surface. But remember that I am using my JTools add-on, which is the script I demoed in the first video in part one. And that is with the Q key, I just hit Q, and now I can choose Add Subsurf. And this is just going to add a subdivision surface modifier to my currently selected object, but it also does two things. It also enables the optimal display, which I prefer to work with, because now in wireframe mode, I see only my actual geometry, not the subdivided geometry, whereas if I turn this off, it's much denser, and it's automatically set the subdivisions to two. And this is the level that I commonly use for most projects, and so since Again, this is just basically a shortcut. It's a custom tool that it's just automatically added a subsurf and applied those couple of settings. Whereas if I do it through this, 
optimal display is off and the resolution is one. So this is just another reason I like to use this. Now we've set that, now I wanna set the shading to smooth. So if I hit T to bring up my toolbar, underneath the object tools here, I can see smooth shading. So let's just click smooth and that will set the shading to smooth. You can also do that from the J tools by hitting Q and choose shade smooth or shade flat. What we have now is basically we have the overall whole of our plane. We've got a few things we need to do. Like you can see that some of our outlines are a little bit small now. So we might go in, we might scale some of these up. So I'll just scale them like this. And we don't care about any of the detail at this point. The only thing I care about is that we are representing the overall shape of the plane here. And this looks pretty good. So we've got it all. Now you will notice that there's some crinkling in these areas, but we don't have to worry about those because we're gonna clean those up later. Now, if we look at the outline here, we can see that maybe we need a little bit more volume in here. So let's just hit Control R. We'll add that loop there, left click scale it up and then maybe we'll pull this out along the y-axis which we can do by selecting it and then hit g and y so anytime you use a transform whether that's grab rotate or scale if you then hit the axis whether it's x y or z press those keys it will then lock it to that axis during the transform so hitting g and y will lock it like that and we can just pull that out there the reason that we've done this is basically we've created this kind of elongated football and this is then going to give us the blocked in base such that we can go in and use this basically as a target to then shrink, literally shrink wrap, think of like a vacuum sealed bag, vacuum seal the things like the cockpit design right here, here we go, this cockpit just like this. And so this is going to allow us to cut that in very, very easily and maintain this exact form. So this may seem a little bit overkill in the way that we're doing it, but as we start to do it, I think you'll see the power pretty quickly. So that's it for this video. We've now got our blocked in body and we're ready to jump in and start detailing the body mesh.